In this video, I talk about the mechanism of action of first and second generation antipsychotics. I will discuss the mechanism of action of aripiprazole in another video. So, this slide is an outline of the key topics we are going to discuss in the following minutes. First, we'll see how all antipsychotics reduce dopaminergic neurotransmission. Also, we will review the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia. And finally, I will present some relevant pharmacological properties of, of second-generation agents, such as 5-HT2A antagonism, fast dissociation from D2 receptors, and 5-HT1A agonism. So, let's start by answering this very important question. What do all antipsychotics have in common? The answer is relatively simple they all reduce dopaminergic neurotransmission. In the upcoming slides, we'll see how and where this takes place and why dopaminergic blockade is important in psychosis pathophysiology. Now, we'll study how antipsychotics reduce dopaminergic neurotransmission. There are two options. The first is through D2 antagonism. Both first and second generation antipsychotics can block D2 receptors. The second option is through partial agonism. At this time, the only approved third-generation antipsychotic is aripiprazole. We'll discuss its mechanism of action in another video. As we discussed in the dopamine pathways video, there are four pathways key to antipsychotics pharmacology. Blockade of two of these pathways can lead to adverse effects. The other two pathways are relevant to schizophrenia symptoms. In this figure, the mesolimbic pathway is shown in blue. The dopamine theory postulates that positive symptoms such as delusions, hallucinations and thought disorder are caused by an overactivity of this pathway. In the other figure, the mesocortical pathway is depicted in red. Recent findings suggest that a dysfunction of the mesocortical pathway may be a part of the neurobiology of negative and cognitive symptoms. So, in review, an excessive activation of the dopamine mesolimbic pathway is related to positive symptoms, while negative and cognitive symptoms might be caused by mesocortical dysfunction. The dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia postulates that postsynaptic dopamine antagonism is a common mechanism that explains antipsychotic properties. The pharmacologist and clinician Stephen Stahl argues that it would be more appropriate to refer to this theory as the dopamine hypothesis of positive symptoms of schizophrenia. The reason is that there are more pathways and psychopathological dimensions that are not included in this theory. So, so what is the evidence that backs up the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia? The risk of drug-induced psychosis is very high with drugs that increase synaptic dopamine availability. This includes uh, drugs such as cocaine, amphetamines, and levodopa. In fact, psychosis can be a potential complication for patients suffering from Parkinson's disease treated with levodopa. As I mentioned before, Schizophrenia neurobiology is very complex and the dopamine theory has limitations. The first limitation is that it doesn't explain cognitive deficits in schizophrenia patients. The second limitation is that psychotomimetic effects of activation of other pathways are not included in this theory. For example, dilucergic acid is a 5-HT2 agonist that can produce psychotic symptoms. Let's discuss now the mechanism of action of first and second generation antipsychotics. First generation or conventional antipsychotics are D2 antagonists. They lower dopaminergic neurotransmission in the four dopamine pathways. In addition, they can also block other receptors such as histamine 1, muscarinic 1, and alpha-1. 
among others. Second generation antipsychotics are also known as atypical antipsychotics. This term was originally used to refer to a low risk of extrapyramidal effects for the antipsychotic clozapine. The other less used term is serotonin dopamine antagonists. This describes one of the key features, which is the ability to block serotonin receptors. One of the most important features of second generation antipsychotics is their 5-HT2A antagonism. In this slide, we'll use clozapine as an example. This is because this was the first drug in the group. Clozapine has a very high affinity for 5-HT2A receptors and a lower D2 affinity than haloperidol. This led researchers such as Herbert Meltzer to propose that the differential antipsychotic effect of clozapine is related to its high 5-HT to D2 ratio. Another theory of atypicality proposes that second generation antipsychotics dissociate rapidly from D2 receptors. This would be a possible explanation for the lower risk of extrapyramidal symptoms of drugs such as clozapine. This table compares first and second generation antipsychotics in terms of uh, their binding to D2 receptors. Conventional antipsychotics tend to bind more tightly to dopamine receptors than dopamine itself. Clozapine and the other second generation agents bind to D2 receptors more loosely. So in the presence of dopamine, they tend to come off the receptor more easily. This short sequence uh, depicts fast dissociation from D2 receptors. In this image, we can see the loose binding of a second generation agent to the receptor. In this slide, we see that in the presence of dopamine, the drug easily dissociates from the receptor. Now, here we can see how dopamine finally binds the D2 receptor. Another property of second generation antipsychotics is that some of them are 5-HT1 agonists. This includes uh, drugs such as ciprasidone, quetiapine and clozapine. What is the importance of this? The answer is that 5-HT1A agonism would increase dopamine release in the prefrontal cortex and also reduce glutamate release. PET studies show that D2 receptor occupancy predicts clinical efficacy and extrapyramidal symptoms. In this graphic, we see that occupancies in the range between 60 and 75% are associated with clinical antipsychotic efficacy. Increasing the antipsychotic dose above a 78% occupancy increases risk of extrapyramidal symptoms. So, in clinical terms, this means that the optimal dosing of any antipsychotic agent is one that occupies between 60 to 75% of D2 receptors. This table summarizes some core concepts on the mechanism of action of first and second generation antipsychotics. Conventional agents are D2 antagonists while second-generation antipsychotics have a high 5-HT2A D2 ratio. This means that they block more potently 5-HT2A receptors than D2 receptors. They also show rapid dissociation from D2 receptors, and some of them, such as quetiapine, ciprasidone, and clozapine, have 5-HT1A agonism. Depending on each individual agent, both first and second generation antipsychotics can block muscarinic 1, histamine 1, and alpha 1 receptors, among others. This is the end of the module. Thanks for watching.